while a picturesque Bay Area sunset was the serene setting outside of San Francisco's Candlestick Park, inside, two playoff contenders were anything but congenial. San Francisco's Monty Clark was in his first and only season as 49ers head coach after spending five years advising the Miami Dolphin offensive line. The newest student in Clark's starting lineup, untested Scott Bull. The Arkansas rookie replaced injured 49er quarterback Jim Plunkett. Bull's last start was a New Year's Day Cotton Bowl victory against the Georgia Bulldogs. This time, the Bulldogs were in his backfield, running back to Delvin Williams, number 24, and Wilbur Jackson formed one of the NFL's most potent ground games. On this night, the 49ers faced Jim Marshall, Alan Page, and a veteran Minnesota defense known as the Purple People Eaters. But the first course proved to be a little too much for Minnesota to stomach. Delvin Williams would rush for 1,203 yards in 1976, a new San Francisco record. He went on to earn all pro honors that year, the NFL's number three rusher behind legends O.J. Simpson and Walter Payton. Wilbur Jackson, number 40, was more of a meat and potatoes runner, yet quite reliable to bring home the gravy. Jackson scored the game's first touchdown, culminating a 51-yard drive as San Francisco quickly established a running game that would take the early pressure off of Scott Bull. Opposing quarterbacks could rarely escape 49er defensive pressure, not with number 53 Tommy Hart around. Hart's 16 sacks led the team, and he was named starter in the Pro Bowl. Another All-Pro, Cleveland Elam, number 72, and Jimmy Webb combined for 21 and a half more sacks in 1976. And an occasional belly flop. Excuse me, Miss Manners. While quarterback Fran Tarkenton wasn't always a sitting duck, he frequently found his wings clipped. The 49er Gold Rush led the league in sacks and treated running backs with similar disdain. San Francisco's gang tackling style slowed even the great Chuck Foreman in the first quarter. However, Foreman did go on to run for 93 yards in the game. The 49ers next possession netted a 45-yard field goal by Steve Mickemeyer, increasing San Francisco's lead to 10 to nothing. Tarkenton could do no right against the 49ers. He tried tossing a glider, but San Francisco's radar detected it early. Tarkin then completed less than half his passes in the game, and the Vikings were forced to punt seven times. While teammates grew frustrated, Tarkenton remained cool, and eventually Minnesota's sleeping offense caught more than a glimpse of success. Wake-up calls were placed to Tarkenton's wide receivers, and finally, the connection was free of distortion. Tarkenton first singled out number 28, Ahmad Rashad, the all-time Minnesota reception leader. On the other side, Tarkenton lined up Sammy White, voted the NFL Rookie of the Year in 1976, and the Vikings' number two receiver of all time. This touchdown brought the Vikes to within three points, 10 to seven. Then Tarkenton went right back to Rashad, who was finding a home behind the 49er defense. Although this was Ahmad Rashad's first season in Minnesota, his timing with Tarkenton was impeccable. A replay of this touchdown shows how Rashad occupied cornerback Bobby Taylor until the last possible moment, then broke free to meet a perfect touchdown pass. With a little more than a half remaining, Tarkin and stole San Francisco's momentum and... November nights in San Francisco are known to be a little bit chilly, but the 49ers weren't about to let their offense cool off. They couldn't afford to. Minnesota already had a three-point lead, and was impressive passing the ball early in the game. 
As the second quarter neared completion, San Francisco coaches plotted a strategy designed to provide the 49ers with the upper hand at halftime. No secret here, San Francisco would continue running the ball against the Vikings. Backup quarterback Scott Bull was a capable replacement for Jim Plunkett. The ground game, though, is the spinach that gives the San Francisco offense its muscle. Delvin Williams and Wilbur Jackson combined for almost 2,000 yards in 1976. Williams was the first San Francisco back in 17 years to gain 1,000 yards in a season. But as the first half came to a close, Bull was forced to open it up. There was no time to flaunt a clock-eating rushing attack. This is one of the more efficient ways to move downfield in a hurry. Nate Wright was the guilty party here, interfering with San Francisco receiver Gene Washington. The ball was spotted at the one, where Scott Bull demonstrated the most direct way to get from point A to point B. Bull scored the first touchdown of his NFL career, giving San Francisco a 17-13 halftime lead. The matchup of the veteran Viking defense against the rookie quarterback had yet to turn into the mismatch most expected. But beginner's luck began to fade for Bull in the second half. The Vikings' pass rush left Bull no options, and Minnesota's linebackers began filling holes once owned by 49er runners. Minnesota defense had finally surfaced, a defense that makes its own breaks by putting pressure on the quarterback. NFL all-time interception leader Paul Krause, number 22, swiped this Scott Bull pass. Fran Tarkenton once again was in position to give Minnesota the lead, but the Viking offense sputtered. Passes skidded off fingertips. Minnesota was forced to settle for a Fred Cox field goal, still trailing San Francisco by a point. But stopping the 49er running game would be tougher than completing a New York Times crossword puzzle. Pro Bowl wide receiver Gene Washington caught only one pass this night, but he wasn't needed for any more. Running back Wilbur Jackson joined Delvin Williams in gaining more than 150 yards, marking only the third time in league history the two backs on the same team gained at least 150 yards in one game. This run by Jackson set up a 38-yard field goal attempt for Steve Mickemeyer. The kicker made his second three-pointer of the night, and San Francisco extended its lead to 20-16 midway through the fourth quarter. The 49er offense finally ran out of gas, and 49er punter Tom Whittem ran out of footing. This botched 33-yard punt gave the Vikings good field position at the San Francisco 47-yard line. 119 remained, and with Minnesota trailing by four, Tarkenton had only the end zone to shoot for. The scrambler appeared trapped for a 23-yard loss, but as he did for 18 years, Tarkenton served only the minimum sentence. He took a 15-yard intentional grounding penalty instead of the sack, stopping the clock in the process. Tarkenton then completed two passes, this one to Bob Grimm, landing the Vikings on the San Francisco 31. Time was not on Minnesota's side. With only three seconds remaining, Tarkenton hoped for one more miracle from his golden arm. Mel Phillips deflected Tarkenton's pass, but an illegal procedure penalty was called against the Viking before the snap. The clock was reset. Minnesota was granted one more life.
Sammy White couldn't get to the ball, and this time the game was over. The 49ers went on to their first winning season since 1972. Meanwhile, the Vikings would make it all the way to Super Bowl XI, their fourth Super Bowl appearance in eight years. 